worship team could you things will slow down a little bit when summer's over but it's hard to believe summer's almost over our kids are getting ready for school again it just doesn't don't know where the summer went but it's good to be here in God's house this morning we're glad that you're here and it's always great to come together for a time of worship and uh, to fellowship here with one another as God's family. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father, we do ask this morning that as we bow before you and seek to hear you speaking to us, that you might truly open our ears and that you might give us receptive hearts. We want to know what it is that you have to say. Help us that we may truly listen this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I said it before and I'll keep on saying it. I believe we live in a wonderful country. I know there are a lot of things going on around us that may not necessarily be wonderful, but on the whole, we still live in a marvelous country. And there are many things that contribute to that. And one of the most important is the fact that this nation was built on a foundation of belief in God. And growing out of that foundation of belief in God, there is a second thing that has contributed to our greatness, and that is the range of freedoms that we are privileged to enjoy. And going hand in hand with that are the rights which we are guaranteed. Uh, the guarantee of those rights goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence where it speaks about those inalienable rights given to us by our Creator. And it continues in the Constitution with the first ten amendments, you know, the Bill of Rights. And then obviously since that time, since those documents were written, the courts have determined that there are certain other further rights that are ours. Even though they may not be specifically guaranteed in the documents, they're nevertheless a direct outgrowth of the rights that have been guaranteed in those documents. So taken together, all these things have not only helped to make this country what it is today, but they have given us as individuals tremendous freedoms. And they've given to us the ability to do many things that we would never be able to do otherwise. And to me, that's great. It's marvelous. However, the very freedoms that we enjoy, the rights that we are able to exercise, also lead to problems that we have to deal with. And one of the most obvious problems growing out of this is that there are a lot of people around who use these rights in such a way that they actually become destructive. That they're no longer beneficial. Instead of using these rights for the benefit of all, they use them selfishly, immorally, destructively. And certainly that doesn't make for greatness. And one of the rights that is probably more misused and misunderstood and twisted to serve such selfish purposes is what we have come to call the right of privacy. You know the way it's usually stated. What you do in the privacy of your own home, what you do with your own body, is nobody's business but your own. 
Now, I've got to acknowledge that there is a definite element of truth here. If what I do affects only me, then why should anybody else care? If what I do touches only my own body, my own life, then it's my business and nobody else's, right? Now, as I said, while there may be that element of truth in that basic premise, if you look around at what is actually happening, it's clear that there's a definite problem in how many are seeking to apply this and use this right to privacy. It's used to defend all sorts of things. Immoral sexual practices. It's used as a basis for attempts to legalize recreational drugs. It's being used. It's being successfully used for that. It's at the heart of the argument trying to justify euthanasia. And then, of course, you know it's right at the center of the whole abortion issue. And in my mind, it's kind of scary to think of where it might lead next. And the really sad thing is that much of this misuse of this right to privacy is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of life. It's based on the belief that there are actually some things a person can do which affect only him or her. The belief that there are things I can do that only touch my own life and nothing else. It's based on the misunderstanding that there are things that can happen to one individual which don't in some way or other also touch the lives of others. And that simply isn't true. There is always a public effect to our private living. You know, Connecticut is one of the few states that still has no helmet laws for motorcycle riders over the age of 18. They did have at one time. It was abolished. It was repealed. You know on what basis? The main argument was based on this, at the time it was known that as this, but on this right to privacy. It affects only the cyclists. If he gets hurt, she's the only one to suffer, right? I mean, the accident may affect other people, but if he gets hurt because he doesn't wear a helmet, whose fault is it? But the question is, is that really true? Doesn't it affect the families, friends, insurance? If the person injured is no longer able to work, welfare has to take over. We all have to deal with it in essence, and it could go on and on and on. Examples like this can be multiplied over and over again. The point is, our private personal decisions, our private personal actions have wide-ranging effects. And on top of examples such as this, we have something much more direct that speaks to this very issue, and that is the Bible, the Word of God. Because in Scripture, we are shown over and over again that our private morality has ripple effects that touch more than we can possibly imagine. Our private morality always influences our public performance. And this passage that we just read from David's life is a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. Now David steps into the pages of biblical history as a man chosen by God. He seemed to have everything going for him. A lot of things were listed in that passage what God had all done for him. But on top of that, he was a young man who, at one time who had good looks, 
courage, wisdom, a deep love for the Lord and his law. He was even a great musician, poet. We're told the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the Lord richly blessed him materially as well as spiritually. But in spite of everything that he had going for him, we know that disaster struck. A disaster of his own making. He saw this young woman, Bathsheba, as she was bathing herself, and his sensual nature was aroused, and he allowed it to take control, and it turned into lust, and he had Bathsheba brought to him, and you know the rest. Now, according to today's standards, that was a private act, wasn't it? Two consenting adults, nobody else's business. What two consenting adults do in the privacy of their own home is only between the two of them. Doesn't affect anybody else, does it? Or does it? Well, let's see what happened. The reality is David's private moral collapse soon worked itself out in the lives of others. In significant ways. First and the most obvious, Bathsheba became pregnant. Immediately, you've got another life involved. The second goes right along with the first. In an attempt to cover up the first, David made sure that Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, would be sent into battle exactly where the fighting was the heaviest, and he got killed. David was directly responsible in an attempt to cover up this private act. Third, the son born to this illicit union died shortly after being born. Fourth, David's relationship with Bathsheba led to jealousy between David's children and, you know, the rest of the whole family. And that in itself had all kinds of consequences. One of his sons raped his half-sister. He, in turn, was killed by Absalom, and that ultimately led to Absalom's death. And on top of it all, the later division of the nation of Israel into two rival kingdoms, Israel and Judah, can all be traced to exactly this point in history. Now, what I just listed are only the most obvious public consequences of this private indiscretion. It only scratches the surface. But I think you see the point. There's always a public effect to our private living. In fact, let me suggest that there is no such thing as a sin that affects only the person who commits it. No matter how private we believe what we do is, it always works itself out in some manner in the lives of others. It's always true. The reason for that is that there is an interrelatedness to life. Everything in life is linked. Now, we may not be able to explain how it works, but it's there. And it's inescapable. When Albert Einstein propounded the theory of relativity, he said that one of the foundational principles behind it was that all nature is linked. Every piece of energy, every piece of matter, whether mineral, plant, animal, or energy, everything is influenced by everything else. Modern scientists agree with that. Some call it the butterfly effect. I don't know if you've heard of it. 
but it's stated in the claim that something as slight as the movement of a butterfly wing in one part of the world can set forces into motion that affect other weather patterns on the other side of the earth. A ripple effect. You know how it is when you drop a pebble, no matter how small, into a pond. The ripples start there and they move out and no matter how big the water body is, those ripples just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. One meteorologist remarked that if the theory is correct, one flap of a seagull's wings would be enough to alter the course of the weather forever. Now, I'm not going to try to argue theories here. I'm not a scientist. I don't know the details. But the point is that there is an underlying reality with which we're dealing here, and that is the interrelatedness of life. And that is true not just physically, it is also true morally and spiritually. From every life, influences flow out which affect for good and, or bad the lives of other people. There is a ripple effect. Evil can be catching and goodness can be contagious. Paul puts it this way. No man lives to himself. No man dies to himself. I was reading one time about some of the South Pole expeditions and I read the account of Robert Scott and his four companions who were the first to reach the South Pole in 1912. They made it to the South Pole. Sadly, they didn't make it back. They perished on the return journey. Now, the records of this, their private records of this journey were later recovered. And they showed that as these men came near to death, it was the courage and faith of one man that sustained them and comforted them, a man by the name of Edward Wilson. He was a quiet man. He had a calming influence which held the company together, not only on their long voyage to Antarctica, but on their attempt to return. We're told that it was his spirit that often brought healing and reconciliation when tensions arose or arguments started. And Captain Scott himself wrote this about him before he died. His eyes have a blue look of hope about them, and his heart is at peace, knowing he was playing a part in a great scheme of God Almighty. He died as he lived, a good man and a friend beyond compare. And if you ask, what was it that made this man what he was? Well, it was later revealed what the secret of his strength was. On the long journey heading to the South Pole, most of it by boat, obviously, every day, without fail, he would climb the mast to the crow's nest so that he could have a private time of prayer every day without fail. And as they traveled, he used the time he had available to him to actually paraphrase the whole New Testament during his devotional time. You see, it was the quality of his private life that gave him the ability to encourage and heal and bless others. Clearly, his private life left an impact on all those who knew him. And do I really have to explain what all of this has to do with us? Well, let me quickly put it into the context of our faith. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, he told us, you shall be my witnesses. And Paul reminds us that we are ambassadors for Christ. 
And to put it as simply as possible, that means that what the world sees and understands of Jesus depends on what they see in us who use his name. It depends on our public image that we present to the world, our witness. And the public image which people see in us depends on what we are in private. An outward facade of Christianity is soon going to be exposed for what it is if the inner private life is not Christ-like. If we harbor secret sins, envy, resentment, pride, it will, sooner or later, it will make itself known. Remember the words of Jesus. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roof. And it's as Nathan told David in the passage we just read, you did it in secret, but I will do the thing in broad daylight before all people. Our private lives has public consequences. A missionary who had gone to India was speaking to a group of men. And right in the middle of their, his presentation, one man got up, left the room. A few minutes later, he came back. And you could tell that from that point on, he had a different attitude. He listened much more intently. He hung on to every word the missionary was saying. And when the meeting was over, the missionary had the opportunity to speak to this man. And he mentioned to him, you know, I noticed that you got up and left. Was something wrong? Did you get ill or something? And respectfully, the man answered, oh, no, sir. Did I say something to offend you? No, sir. Well, then why did you leave? Sir, he said, I've heard many religious teachers, and they all sound good. However, I've become suspicious of them. So I went out and I talked to the man who's been your driver while you've been here, and the man who drove you here today, and I asked whether you are as good at home as you sounded in your speech. And when he said that you lived up to the message and how you treated him, and even in the privacy of your home, I came back and I began to listen with much greater attention. Our private lives have a public influence, and it begins in your own home, with your own children, but it reaches out to all with whom you come into contact. And so the question I want to ask today is not what kind of image are you projecting, what kind of mask are you putting on for others to see? But what is your inner life like? What are you in your private life? Is that what it should be? You can be sure of this. As the Bible says, your sins will find you out, even the most private ones. And is there anybody here today who can honestly say that their private lives are everything that they should be? In everything? All the time? I know I can't. I know I can't. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in exactly the same place it left David. And I'm happy to say that David's story doesn't end with his sin. It ends with his recovery and restoration. 
As we read in our passage this morning, the day came when the prophet Nathan came to him and confronted him. And David acknowledged what he had done. He recognized the enormity of his private sin, and he turned to God in faith and repentance. This is how David expressed it later on. Have mercy on me, O God, he said. Have mercy on me according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He turned to God with that prayer. And God granted his request. He forgave him. And that forgiveness was followed by recovery and restoration. And it was the same David who would later on write, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. And it's also out of David's line that the Savior came. Because David turned from his private sin to God for forgiveness and cleansing. Because he did that, God was then able to use him to prepare the way for our salvation. And the same thing holds true for us. We're often imperfect. We know we're weak. We fail again and again and again both in our private lives as well as in our public lives. But if we are willing to turn to God with our weaknesses, acknowledging our sins and shortcomings, confessing them to him, asking him to help us overcome them and get them out of our lives, not only will we receive his forgiveness and cleansing, but God will be able to use us as his witnesses his ambassadors, his representatives in the world. Are we willing to allow him to do that? Then we've got to come to him and acknowledge what we are in our private lives so that the others may see and give glory to our Father in heaven. Are you willing to do that? Let's pray. And as we bow before God's throne, I encourage you to ask God to search your heart right now. Ask him to show you where it is that you need his forgiveness his cleansing, his touch in your life, where you need to be restored. If you go to him humbly, he'll do that. And as with David, you will receive his forgiveness. Are you willing to do that? Father, we ask that you do search our hearts right now. Help us to see where we stand. Because we want our lives to be a witness for you, for Jesus. We want our lives to count for you, and we know we can do that only when we allow you to do your work within us. Lord, cleanse us in the inner being. Help us, Lord. Create in us a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within us so that we may serve you faithfully and that your name might be glorified. 